Please turn, if you would, in the back of your hymnals, or if you have the sermon uh, insert, uh, the, the reading is there as well, the uh, Belgic Confession. So either place, either go in your hymnal to page 70 or take your sermon insert. And it was a short enough article that I was able to fit it uh, on that outline. We come to Article 2 of the Belgic Confession, by what means God is made known unto us. And what is it? We know him by two means. First, by the creation, preservation, and government of the universe, which is before our eyes as a most elegant book, wherein all creatures, great and small, are so many characters leading us to see clearly the invisible things of God, even his everlasting power and divinity, as the Apostle Paul says, all which things are sufficient to convince men and leave them without excuse. Second, he makes himself more clearly and fully known to us by his holy and divine word, that is to say, as far as is necessary for us to know in this life, to his glory and our salvation. Amen. Our scripture passages, uh, vitally connected to this catechism article, or this confessional article, is first Romans chapter 1, 18 to 21. Romans 1, 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. His invisible attributes, namely, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so that they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. And the other text is Psalm 19, which we sang a good portion of earlier. But the full text you'll find in your Bibles. Psalm 19, a psalm about the word of creation itself and the word of God written. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words, whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs his course with joy. His rising is from the end of the heavens, its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let us pray. How we pray, Lord, that we would not read your word blinded, hearing words, but in reality being penetrated, not at all. 
Oh Lord, how we should pray. With thy Holy Spirit, shine the light of our of your word into the deep, dark crevices of our soul that it might be illumined. And we might, oh Lord, be delighted because not only has your word illumined our interior life, but your redemption in your true and final word, Jesus Christ, has taken us from darkness to light. Through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, we've looked at uh, article number one of the Belgic Confession, which is about God. There is one God who is simple and invisible and single. And we've looked at his attributes. Some attributes are incommunicable. Uh, those are the attributes are distinctive for who he is. And there are other attributes that we say are communicable. And so far that we're made in God's image and we commune with him, some of his attributes are reflected in and through us on a creaturely uh, level. Article 2 now is what we've come to. And the question here is, okay, uh, say there's God and this is how we understand who he is, but how do I know him? You know, are we just kind of guessing, is kind of constructing him as a, the best we can, hoping that this God, at the end of the day, matches uh, our own conceptions of him? Uh, of course, that's a, a, a very skeptical enterprise, isn't it? But thank the Lord. He has revealed himself to us. Uh, he has revealed himself, first of all, in the world, uh, in the interior life and the exterior life. Uh, and he has revealed himself through his word, a word that is written in the Old and New Covenants. And therein, we can say with confidence on the basis of those two words, we can know God. Because, not that we have searched him out, you know, like you search out a lost coin in your house, or you, you search out some documents that you needed to present to your insurance agent and didn't know what file they're in, and finally found them. No, that's not how we find God. We find him because he comes and reveals himself to us. And his revelation of himself gives us a sure foundation of not guesswork, but of certain knowledge that what we trust in is good and confidently sure because it's God's own revelation of himself. This is how we know God. To know. Now that question of how do you know things in the world of philosophy, they use this word called epistemology. It's the study of how do you know what you know. And the Christian has this wonderful and simple answer that slices through all the skeptical conclusions of the history of philosophy and science. How do we know that we know? Because God says so. And therefore, I can know. What a delight that should be to your soul. Agnostics say, I don't know. Some of them say, you can't know. But as believers in the word of God, in creation and in this book, we say, I can know God and confidently rest myself on that knowledge of him. For he gives us the revelation of himself. So the question becomes this. What do you do with it? You resist it? Eh, it's not clear enough. It's not sure enough. You know, that's what some people think. Or do you receive it? And in receiving it, rest yourself upon it like the psalmist says, on a solid rock of the Word of God. Well, as we mentioned, there are two arenas in which God has revealed himself to us. Uh, the first one is by the creation, preservation, government of the universe, which is before our eyes as a most elegant book. It's like a book. It says that the creatures, great and small, are like so many characters or letters. And they spell out to us uh, who God is uh, through the universe. His 
fingerprints are, are all over it. And, and, and even though it's a book that is not literally a book of words, uh, nonetheless, it is a book of knowledge. And the creatures, great and small, form the characters that bring us this knowledge of God. And this is how Psalm 19 uh, introduces uh, us to the knowledge of God. The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out knowledge. Their speech and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech. There are no words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out throughout the, all the earth. Their words to the end of the world. And in them he set a tent for the sun. It goes out like a bridegroom, leaving his chamber like a strong man, runs in a course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, its circuit to the end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. So the author sees there that God is detected. The heavens declare as if they're speaking the glory of God. We see, as Paul said, his divine nature, his eternal power, are on display, his glory, uh, through the heavens as we gaze upon it. And the sky above, above proclaims his handiwork. We see the sky, we see this world. What do we conclude? That it just kind of popped out of nothing, a, a big bang occurred, and out of that big bang, some motion was created, and out of that motion came the ocean, and out of the ocean came a, 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 a combination of elements that eventually, uh, as the waves of the ocean went back and forth, those elements met together, and just so happened as those elements met together, a lightning struck, and with Shazam, we, we have life that began. Is, is, is that what we see? The psalmist says, no, that's not what you see. You see the signs of an architect. The sky above proclaims his handiwork. Amen. If you're out there walking in some trail someday and a hiker ahead of you uh, accidentally lost his watch and you saw that trail buried in a bunch of dust. And you picked up that watch. What would you think? Wow, just out of time and chance and the tossing together of materials, this watch came together. Well, you, it's crazy. You say, no, there's, it, the watch is evidence of design. You know, tick, 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 and what time is it, right? So the universe itself proclaims not only the glory of the Creator, his eternal power and divinity, as Paul puts it, but also declares his creatorship, his work as the great architect, the great artesian of the universe that so many, believer and unbeliever alike, uh, admire with great beauty. Uh, I myself was able to go to the uh, Monterey Aquarium last Monday. And I was so excited to go there because I knew that these amazing creatures that I would see came from the mind of God. And then from the mind of God, by His Word, they were created and they existed. And such amazing creatures I saw at the aquarium that day. Uh, otters floating on their back who will dive down in the water and they'll pick up a rock and they'll grab some sea urchin or something else they like to eat and they'll put that rock in their tummy then they'll take that mussel or whatever it is and bang it on the rock till it breaks open and they eat it. All came about by chance. You know, it just happened. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Then we saw a little jellyfish illuminated little skirts puffing out so they move through the water and trails. What a curious, unusual mind. So many things, all pointing to this great creator. Calvin says this, When a man from beholding and contemplating the heavens has been brought to acknowledge God, he will learn also to reflect upon and to admire his wisdom and power as displayed on the earth. <coughs> Not only in general, but even in the minutest plants. 
Well, since those days of Calvin and, and as science has progressed, we've developed some very powerful telescopes to look upon the heavens even more and detect and find and see even more. And, and microscopes to go the other direction, to look downward and, and find these otherwise invisible creatures and invisible cells to the naked eye that we see. And we should stand back as we look at the universe above and the universe below through telescope and microscope, sing God's praises and be admirers of his handiwork in the joy of our heart. His fingerprints, the psalmist tells us, is over everything. And even though the sun doesn't look down and ask David Inks, how are you doing today? So great to give you some warm light. Welcome to your morning. It says nothing. But on the other hand, as the psalmist says, day to day pours out speech. And night to night reveals knowledge as you look in the stars. There is no speech. There are no words whose voice is not heard, but yet their voice does go out. No, there's not word spoken, but the knowledge is so evident, it's as if, as our confession says, as if everything, our characters in the book of creation, proclaiming to us, speaking to us of God, uh, and references uh, the, the sun itself is like a, a running like a strong man running its course or like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber as he comes up out of the sky and and runs through the heavens and finishes on the other end of the world all of it proclaiming the knowledge of god and yet paul in romans says that even though fallen Men, sinful men, have this knowledge universally. He knows that God is there. He can detect some of God's attributes, his eternal power and divine nature. And even though he knows inwardly that he's not just the result of space and time, that as a knower, Of these things, he also knows reflexively that he is the image of the creator that has made these things. And inbuilt within him is the sense that worship and service is owed the creator. And even though he knows all that, Paul says, it renders him inexcusable. That renders him inexcusable for his failure to fear God, for his failure to honor God as God and what? And to give him thanks. If you're not a Christian, you should still give thanks for the food you get to eat and the clothes you wear, the life you have, and the enjoyment you can have in life. You should thank God for it. Even if you're not a Christian. And you're accountable. Because you have this knowledge, Paul says, and not a single one of us rightly responds to the knowledge we have. We darkened our minds and our hearts with it. And therefore we are rendered inexcusable, Paul says. But that's not all of God's revelation. Psalm 19 goes on to open up another aspect of God's revelation. Uh, His word, his word not in a non-word sense of the creation, revealing the knowledge of God creator, but his word by way of his covenant word, the word written. And the written word began first on Mount Sinai. I know, you thought it was Genesis 1-1. You're wrong. It began on Mount Sinai, the written word. That's where it came historically in point in time, written with the finger of God upon tablets of stone. The word written, the word of God, the 
covenant word. A word that bound a people to the Lord under obligation. The law of the Lord is perfect. That's the word Yahweh. The covenant name is now introduced. The law of Yahweh is perfect. The testimony, the precepts, the commands, the rules. All these words from God to Israel on Mount Sinai were the words of the old covenant revelation that taught them more of their obligation toward God. And along with it also promised something to them. Verse 11. Moreover by them is your servant warned. And in keeping them there is great reward. Notice the orientation. Notice the spin that the psalmist gives to the law of the Lord. The testimonies of the Lord. The commandments of the Lord. They warn you. Warn you what? Some limp-wristed, human, fatherly warning. If you do that again, I'm going to... Right? Thinking that that will be all fine. Right? No, it's not that. It's a warning. If you do not obey, you will be cursed. On the other hand, if you do, you will be blessed. By them, thy servant is warned. And in keeping them, there's great reward. Sounds like Deuteronomy 28, doesn't it? Listing all the blessings for obedience to the law of the Lord. Listing all the curses for disobedience to the law of the Lord. The warnings, the the promised blessings, the reward. You would keep God's law. Sounds like Deuteronomy 28. There are responsibilities of the creature to the creator and the law spells them out. Of course, the question is this, is does the law liberate us? Does the law set us free? Does the law kind of say, I know the right thing to do. So you therein do it. I know I shouldn't, so therefore I won't. Yeah. We know how that goes. The law is powerless to effect what it calls us to by way of responsibility. But it doesn't slow up on its sanctions. It's proffered cursing and blessing. Do You see, that law is indeed a covenant. It binds us to God. It binds us with obligations. And it tells us there there are outcomes with how we perform. In Romans chapter 3 verse 18. It tells us by the works of the law. No flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. And that because of God's law, that God's law, even though God's law is written on tablets of stone and given to Israel and they were there saying, yes, all the Lord has spoken, we will do. Even though that's true, the old covenant law nonetheless is a reflection of an even greater, broader relationship between mankind and God. In other words, all mankind have moral motions, has a sense of, of what is right and what is wrong, even though they may not have affirmed the Ten Commandments in and of themselves. It's a universal reality it's in the hearts of all. A person may not even know there's Ten Commandments, yet he has a sense of what's right and what is wrong as a, as a fundamental makeup of his uh, constitution. Paul in Romans chapter 2, verse 14 and 15 Uh, brings this very point (coughs) home of the universal nature of God's law in the hearts of all. He says, For when Gentiles, that is non-Jews, who were not recipients of the old covenant on Sinai, when, when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves even though they do not have the law. 
They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts and their conscience bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or excuse them. See, if you're made in the image of God, unless you are a constituted social path, and that is a person who ostensibly conscience is so hardened, they just do whatever they want without any forethought of what the consequences may, may be or whether it's right or wrong. But even that is, like I say, ostensible social path. But if you're made in the image of God, you have that moral sense. You have that law that's working in and on you that is from God insofar that you're made in his image. And thus, the law that is given on Sinai has its broader appeal to all men made and women made in the image of God. And at the end of the day, at the end of the day, whether it's, whether it's the law by being made, created in God's image, or whether it's the law specifically spelled out uh, on Sinai, on those tablets of stone, in writing, in a covenant form, it has the same effect. It has the same endpoint. The same endpoint, Paul says, is that every mouth will be closed. When you come into God's courtroom to give an account of yourself before God based on your response to the law, Paul says, every mouth will be closed. What does he mean by that? It means nobody will have a defense. <laughs> what do you got to say in your defense? Nothing. Every mouth will be closed, Paul says. As he says in Romans 1.18, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness. And as Paul says in Romans 4.15, and if you're a note taker, write this down, Romans 4.15, that the law works wrath. The law works wrath, why? Because we're all sinners and we break it, that's why. However, even though creation itself, even though the old covenant law itself binds us over to God with our own guilt and expectation of judgment, it's not over. And Psalm 19 indicates that it's not over. He says in verse 12, after speaking of all these different components of the law of the Lord, and that by them your servant is warned, keeping them's great reward. What does he say? Who can discern his errors? Who can get a handle on the multitude of sins that you've committed and continue to commit day in and day out? Who can keep track of them all? See? Who can discern his errors? You may have the best Freudian psychologist in the world will go deep in the spade work of your soul and bring forward all that's there. And guess what? After he's put on the miner's helmet and he searched out the caverns of your interior life, guess what? When he comes back and says, look, there's a lot of dirt down there. Guess what? It's only a small portion. <laughs> Who can discern his errors? But I've spent thousands on this guy to help me to see who can discern his errors? Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the, the heart is deceitful and desperately sick. What? Who can understand it? We all want to try to figure ourselves out. We all kind of secretly think, yeah, I, I, I kind of know who I am. I got, I got a handle on this. You know, we, we, we flatter ourselves. I've got a lot of self-insight. Truth of the matter is, who can discern his errors? Who can account for all of his sins? Psalm says, declare me innocent from hidden faults. That's what he's saying. Yeah, I can see I can see some. I can see a portion. You know, Psalm 51, my sin is ever before me. Got that. But it's only the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> There's a lot more stuff hidden there. Declare me innocent from hidden faults. To declare innocent is basically has to do with to forgive, to forgive me. Declare me, declare me innocent, to acquit me. Acquit me of 
all this hidden away stuff. See, biblically, the picture of the human heart is, is not encouraging. Biblically, the picture of the human heart is not so, oh, we're all basically good and mean well and trying our best. You know, that's, not the, that's not the biblical picture. <laughs> Be nice, but ain't true. <laughs> Truth is, biblically, we're a black cauldron of bubbling depravity. So the next time you make a big batch of black beans and you're starting to heat up and bubble around in there, get your spoon and stir them a little bit. And then say to yourself, that's me. <laughs> and you've gotten a lot closer to the truth than all this chatter about everyone's basically good. <laughs> Who can discern his heirs? He quit me of my hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Guess what that, 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 that's a good word there, presumptuous sins. It's the word in the Hebrew that, ha, that comes from boiling over. Keep me back from what? Boiling over. He had the black cauldron there all along. The hidden, the lid was on. But it is hot. Keep me from, keep it from boiling over. What happens when your sin boils over in your life? Now it's not just you, is it? Somebody else just got a hot black bean in the side of their face. Right? God and everybody is now aware of it. Keep me from boiling over. Lord, <coughs> I can't begin to discern the depth of what's in the cauldron. But Lord, what's he saying? Just keep it from boiling over. <coughs> you see what the prayer is there in the psalmist. Is may I be acquitted and may my sin get controlled because it's out of control. That's our condition. You know, we may think that I can get a handle on it. But it's like squeezing one of those water balloons. You know, you squeeze it at this end and it pops out the other. Then you squeeze that in and it pops out over there. That's the way it is. We can't get a handle on it. We need to cry out to God that he might be acquit us that he might forgive us and grant us the grace that they may not have dominion over me as he says in verse 13 then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression rather let the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight this prayer of the psalmist you see is is a prayer that's long since creation and the fall of man it's a prayer that is 500 years since God revealed to them the Ten Commandments on Sinai. And it's a prayer that's a thousand years before Christ. But it is a prayer that is answered. It's a prayer that is answered in the New Covenant in Jesus Christ. It is the only place this prayer is answered. is in the New Covenant in Jesus Christ. This, there is a concrete historical answer to the one weighed down by the word of the old creation, by the word of the old covenant that shuts his mouth, that searches him out and points him to his own black cauldron. And that historic answer is when the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And when that word, that word born of a woman under the law, that word who took our old creation bodies, that word who took the old covenant law and was born under it and lived from conception to cross in complete obedience to that word and lived at the end of his life, retook the full curse of the word of creation in the old covenant upon himself so that our prayer, O Lord, equip me, forgive me, would not just be a desperate cry shot up into the emptiness of the vast universe, but a cry that is based on, settled on, the perfect finished work of Jesus Christ. It is a prayer just not of some therapeutic unloading of my heart and conscience because I'm bowed down in the moment. It is a prayer that is based on blood, the blood of Christ. 
It is a prayer that you can confidently say on the base of the word of God, He hears me. Though my stain may run deep and my hidden faults be many, I know that I'm acquitted because of the blood of Christ. This prayer is a prayer that is answered only in the new covenant word in Jesus Christ. For on the cross, Christ bore our sins in his own body. On the cross, he took the curse of the broken law, whether Sinai or creation itself in the heart of all. He took it all. He drank it dry. And on the cross, he put to death the old creation, the old man, the old heart, so presumptuous and boiling over. And on that cross, praise God, he ratified a new covenant, a new covenant for sinners, a sinner's covenant where their sins could be forgiven And the power of presumptuous, boiling over sins that dominate our lives can be broken. For this is the promise of the new covenant based on the shed blood of Christ. Forgiveness of sin and a new heart. A new heart no longer under the dominion of sin. But wanting to please and serve and has the power of the very resurrection life of Christ to walk anew. Here is where the prayer of the psalmist is answered It is in the new covenant word of Jesus Christ for you and for me. And here we come to know God so much more richly and deeply. For we know him not just as creator, not just as lawgiver to whom we are obliged, but we know him as redeemer, as the solid rock, as the psalmist said out of which he lifts me from the miry clay and puts me in a place of confidence before him. For it is a place where the new covenant has been confidently ratified in Jesus Christ. So where can forgiveness be found? Where can a heart and a mouth be renewed? Truly, the meditation of that heart And the words of that mouth could be pleasing to the Lord. It is found in the knowledge of God in the new covenant in Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, do not stop with knowing God through creation. Go on to know God through the old covenant law. And continue to go on to know him even more gloriously and fully as redeemer in Jesus Christ. For you, the chief of sinners knowing that he has dealt with your problem, that you might know him and might be able to say in your life, my chief reason now for existing is to know Jesus Christ and to make him known. Because nothing is more sweeter. No honey is sweeter and no money more valuable than knowing Christ in the new covenant, which is the privilege of his people. Let us pray.